All right, so our prime cost is what? What makes up the prime cost? What's one of the parts? There's two parts to prime cost. Okay, so one is food and beverage cost. Food and beverage cost is one part of our prime cost. FMB is food and beverage, by the way. That's an acronym you're gonna, an abbreviation you're gonna see a lot in our industry. FMB. Okay. FMB cost, and then what's the other half? Labor. Good. Labor cost. We add those two things together, and we get our prime cost. Why is it called prime cost? Or why do we just look at these two for our prime cost? It goes back. Okay, so I mean, everything is a percentage within the cost of our operation, yes. Um, but they do change. They are the ones that we are the most controllable, right? Everything else besides labor and food costs and beverage costs, we can't control our rent. We can't control how much we pay for Wi-Fi. We can't control those other expenses, which we're going to talk about, I think, in the next chapter um, as the other expenses, the other costs. But um, prime costs are our most controllable. We can control our food cost percentage to some extent. We can control our labor cost percentage. Okay, how do we control our labor cost percentage? By cutting hours if you're not busy. By cutting hours if you're not busy, right? Sending people home. Sending people home. If we only have five people in our dining room, do we need to have seven servers sitting around doing nothing? No, okay? If we have, um, you know, only about 10 or 15 covers, so a cover is an individual, a guest, we have 10 or 15 covers in the dining room. Do we need to have a fully staffed kitchen? No. And so if we have those people who are cross-trained, that somebody can manage the grill station as well as the um, pasta station or the salad station, if they can man both of those things, then we can cut down to what we call a skeleton crew. Okay? Bare bones, skeleton crew. This is, a, this is the bare minimum we need to operate. Um, and so when I was at TJ Fridays, a lot of time for lunch, that's what would happen. We'd get to the point where, you know, we'd have our lunch rush, and then we'd got to be down to one or two servers, one bartender, and maybe two people in the kitchen, and that was it. So there's five people running the restaurant at that point because we weren't busy. Um, and so that's why our labor costs and food costs are the prime cost. We want to focus on those because it is our most controllable, and it also is our largest percentage of our sales. Okay, so if you remember, food cost percentage should be somewhere between 30 to 33 percent. Okay, our labor cost should not exceed 35 percent. Our labor cost should not exceed 35 percent. If we max this out, Let's say 33 and 35, that's 68%. That means 68 cents of every dollar that's coming in is going to cover just these two costs. That leaves me with 32 cents on every dollar to cover my other expenses and hopefully my profit. Hopefully give me some profit. Okay, And so that's why if we can decrease these costs by a percentage, we can go down to 32%. That's a penny we get to save on every dollar. And you think, wow, just a penny. That's just one penny. But if my sales are $2 million, that one penny is going to add up. That 1% is going to add up quite a bit. Okay? Okay, so we have two different types of standards, quality standards and quantity standards. Um, as we're trying to build in this control process. So the quality standard, what does that refer to? What does quality refer to? Okay, so following the recipes and consistency, good. And so the quality standards, they refer to um, primarily the cooking method. And the quality of the ingredients. Okay, it's the ingredients themselves. So 
Sorry, my handwriting is horrible on this. The ingredients themselves, those are the quality standards. So if my recipe calls for green bell peppers, I need to have green bell peppers. Can I substitute red bell peppers? No. It depends. It depends on what the recipe is, right? And they might be more expensive, but it might be a situation where all of a sudden red bell peppers go on sale because the, the food provider like Cisco needs to get rid of them before they go bad. Just like you have to use your product before it goes bad, they have to get rid of their product before it goes bad in their warehouse. And so they may have a special on red bell peppers. And you might look and say, you know what? We have green bell peppers with our fajitas. Can we do red bell peppers? Yeah. Yeah. Is the flavor profile a little different? Yeah. yeah. But it's a little sweeter. But can we do it on fajitas? Probably. If we're doing a specific, I don't know, what's a, what's a very specific ingredient that cannot be substituted for anything else? Tomatoes. Tomatoes. Okay. So, like, the difference between a Roma tomato and a vine-ripened tomato, is there any difference in flavor? Not a whole lot. I mean, if, and if I'm going to use it for salsa, does it matter? No, but if I'm going to use it for hamburgers, I don't want to use a Roma tomato. They're a little tiny, right? So I want to use a good-sized tomato for hamburgers. So really the purpose, the cooking method, and the ingredients refer, refer to our quality. The quantity refers to weight, volume, like, you know, and the count, okay? So weight, volume, and the count. So when I was at TGI Fridays, we'd make our own salads, our own house salads, okay? And so um, the house salad recipe recipe was one bag of lettuce, because before the shift, we got this giant vat of lettuce, and we put it into little individual bags. We pre-portioned it, okay? So it was one bag of lettuce, three tomato wedges, three cucumbers, and two ounces of dressing, okay? So quantity... There was one bag of lettuce, which had a particular weight to it, okay? We had three tomatoes, three cucumbers, and two ounces of dressing. The volume is the vol is, is weight, or sorry, is the measurement of liquid. So that's two ounces of dressing is the volume. And that was our recipe. If I gave four tomatoes, then I'm spending more money making that salad it's going to affect my food cost, okay? So as a manager, we have to control what's going out of our kitchen, okay? We have to control that. Um, what is another example of a quantity standard? Amazon tomatoes. I'm sorry? Amazon tomatoes. No, quantity. Oh, quantity. Yeah, quantity. Yes. Waste logs. Okay, so with waste logs, yeah, we're looking at how much the quantity that we wasted, but I'm, talk I'm thinking more of like the standards that we need to abide by to make sure that we're managing our food cost percentage appropriately. Yes, Greg. Alcohol. Okay, so what do you mean by alcohol? Like when you use a jigger, you don't just free pour it. You actually okay, yeah, alcohol. absolutely. So when you're making a beverage, an alcoholic beverage, a mixed beverage, you need to use the actual jigger that we do one ounce or one and a half ounce, whatever that measurement is. Okay, when we're talking about alcoholic beverages, what else can be referred to as count? Your mixers. What, about, what do we usually put on it? All, all of our garnishes, okay? So does anybody not know what a garnish is? That's okay if you don't, raise your hand. Don't be afraid. Okay, so a garnish is something that enhances the plate or enhances the, the drink, okay? So that orange wedge that's on the side, the... Um, you know, if you have, my favorite Bloody Mary comes with a big old piece of uh, bacon in it, right? Bacon and some celery stick and some olives. I like extra olives, right? So I'm, I'm actually affecting the food cost when I ask for extra olives. Um, the volume. How many people, when you buy, when you get salads, you like, I want extra salad dressing, okay? Or how many of your guests are like, I want extra salad dressing on the side? Well, your recipe is based on a specific amount of dressing, Okay, so whenever we ask for extra things, it's costing more. Not do we always charge for it? No. Not always, but sometimes we do. Okay. Um, the last thing, like what I was, I think I mentioned before, as far as controlling costs, right? If we notice that a lot of people are not using the lemons, 
when we use tea, when we give them a tea or a, a water, then we make it to where it's lemons on request. Otherwise, we're giving them a lemon, they're gonna put it on the table, it's gonna go in the trash, right? And so that's wasted money. If we think about it, whatever a lemon costs, let's say it costs 30 cents, okay? A lemon costs 30 cents. Let's just use this example real quick. Thirty cents per lemon. How many wedges do we usually get out of a lemon? Six. Let's say six, right? Let's keep it kind of simple. So six. Thirty divided by six is what? Five cents per wedge. That's a nickel. Every twenty people is a dollar. If I serve three hundred, two hundred people. That's a lot of money that's going out the door if people aren't using it. So that's why we say lemons on request. Or you can have your servers. Would you like a lemon with that? And that would save so much money just by doing that simple thing, right? But the, when it comes to the control process for the managers, it's our responsibility com to communicate that to our servers and our staff and our team members. Um, another thing, when I order a... Um, my beverage, used, my beverage of choice used to be a cherry vodka sour. That was in my younger days. Don't judge me, okay? Um, but I would always ask for extra cherries. I love the little cherries on the bottom, right? And so one cherry is part of the recipe. That's part of just putting like four or five cherries in each of my drinks. And so that affects the food cost, okay? And the beverage. So now we want to monitor our actual performance, okay? And to do that, we want to look and see what is what is going on. So how do we monitor for actual performance? Okay, so we can look at what our what our expenses are compared to our profit, okay, or what, what are compared to our sales. We can look at that, okay. But what's a, what's a, what's what's one way that you can actually monitor? Something that you can actually do to watch oh, like your, your actual performance. Okay, what's that? Okay, so we want to look at data. So how do we, where, where does that data come from? We can ask from our, we can access it from our POS system, our point of sales. Okay, so we can access it from there. We can run a report for what we did in sales that day and what items we sold that day. Okay, so if I look and I see on my POS that I sold 25 steaks and I go back to the kitchen and it looks like I had 27 steaks went out of my kitchen, I'm missing two steaks. So that's my actual performance. I'm monitoring that. And people have to know that you're monitoring it. If you don't, if you get lax, people are gonna start thinking that they can get away with stuff. And it happens. Yes, sir. Um, I have a friend of mine I was talking to yesterday. Uh, she works at a, at a Mexican restaurant and uh, one of her best, a uh, good friend of hers got fired. She was floating teas around. Uh, throughout the throughout the thing, and I guess uh, the owner ha had put an alert system on his computer so it notifies him when that happens. And she ended up like in a month's time, it was almost like twelve hundred dollars worth of just of T sales just from her floating them around. Okay. So she's pretty much just stealing the money from the T sales. What the, like like the beverage, the tea, iced yeah, tea yeah, beverage. Iced tea okay. Beverage, yeah. So people would pay for it, and she yeah, would just pocket and, the money. Yeah, and she what she would do is that she would change the order. Like after she gave him the receipt, she'd go back and put it put put them as a water, and then just transfer it to the next receipt and transfer it to the next receipt. Oh, interesting. <laughs> right. Okay. So this brings me to a really good point, um, and I'll probably mention it a couple times as well. There's this thing called the eighty ten ten rule. Okay. 80% of the people in this world are going to do the right thing no matter what. 10% of the people, no, just kidding. Let me, let me change that. 10% of the people are going to do the right thing no matter what. Oh, that's really high. 10% of the people in this world are going to do the right thing no matter what. Okay? Ten percent of the people in this world are going to do the wrong thing no matter what. Okay? 80% of the people in this world are going to do the right thing if they know there's a potential of being caught. So if you are actually monitoring your performance, if you're staying on top of it as a manager, and people know that you go in and check how many steaks were sold that day. Or here's a perfect example. When I was at TJ Fridays, I was a brand new server, right? And my server trained me. So my server trainer trained me. And the, the guideline 
rule was if your friends come in, you you do what? Have someone else. You give them the hookup, right? That's what we did anyways. I don't know. <laughs> Never mind. Y'all are more y'all are part of that eighty percent. Maybe the ten percent. But my, my server trainer was like, if your friends come in, don't charge them for tea. Don't charge them for beverages. Don't charge them for a salad. You can go back in the back and make yourself a salad and then They'll just add it to your tip, whatever that cost of that salad is. Well, apparently I have cheap friends because they never added that to my tip. Okay? Um, but one thing is my manager, uh, Kristen, she said, she said, David, I noticed that table 32 has tea, has drinks on the table, tea and soda, but there's no drinks on the on the computer. So at any given point during a shift, a manager can go up to the com the, the computer system and they can look at what's on every single check. And they can look at that table and they say, oh, there's four drinks there, but there's no drinks over here. And so she just casually said, hey, David, I noticed that table 32 has no drinks on their check, but there's four drinks on the table. Please make sure you get those on the, on the check before you um, close out, right? And so she could come over and she could be a total whatever, okay? She could be like, she could be a, an ugly, mean manager and start yelling at me and saying, you're stealing from the company because you're not giving, you're not charging people for drinks. But instead, she took out an opportunity to say, hey, I'm watching you. Rather than coming and being really ugly about it, she just said, hey, I noticed that these drinks are there. Now, if she has to come to me four times during a shift, then we have an issue and we have to have some corrective action, okay? But that, just her telling me, hey, I noticed there's drinks on that table and there's no drinks on the, on the, on the uh, check. Please make sure you get them on there before you close the checkout. And then she's probably gonna make a note about table 32. And then she can go back and when I close that checkout, she can go back to look at 30, table 32 and see if I actually did put drinks on the check, okay? Because that's another thing my trainer told me. Don't charge people for drinks. They'll add it to your tip, right? Well, for the restaurants, we charge, what, what do we charge for a tea? Like $2.50, like $3, $3, right? It costs us maybe a nickel to make tea. So that's where we're making a lot of our money. We can't. Um, you know, somebody, somebody told me once that, that their uh, servers were so excited because they sold like so many lobster dinners during a, during a dinner, set, dinner menu, right? And they're like, I don't care how many lobster menus you sell. You, the servers, they see it as I'm selling a really high ticket item. The kitchen and the books, though, we don't make as much profit on those lobsters. So I want you to add salads. I want you to add appetizers. I want you to add drinks to those checks because... That's where I'm making the most of my money. That's where my, my, my percentage of my profit is so much higher on those items. The larger the, the, the larger the amount of the ingredient, typically the smaller the profit. And we're gonna talk about that in a later chapter. So then we wanna compare our actual performance to what our standards were. So in this example, our, our example is in dollars, okay? Now in this case, we have to do, when we, this is what we call a variance, okay? So our variance is gonna equal to our actual minus the budgeted. Our actual minus the budgeted. That is what our variance is. Variance is just a fancy way of saying difference, okay? Now in this case, just like our sales formula, our profit loss formula, the actual has to go first. Because if we have a negative number, that means we did not meet our budgeted, okay? That means we, that our, our variance is a negative. Is it always bad to have a negative difference? What do you think? Yes with the thumbs up, no with the thumbs down, or thumbs sideways for I have no idea what you're talking about. It depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about food or money or waste or... Good, exactly. So it depends on what you're talking about. If I'm talking about my sales, if I didn't meet my budget in sales, that's probably not a good thing, okay? But if I'm talking about my expenses, like my labor, if I spent less money than I budgeted for labor, that's probably a good thing, Okay? If I spent more money than I budgeted for, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It depends again, right? All of this stuff is very dependent on the situation. If I spent more money on my, on my labor, but my sales were very much higher, that means I had to spend more money, 
to make sure I sold that amount of stuff, right? So you have to be able to justify why your variance is the way it is, okay? Um, and so if you're, let's say your sales, our sales in this case were $10,000 less. So should we have a lower percentage or a higher percentage for our labor? Lower percentage. We should hopefully have a lower percentage. We should have a negative variance on our labor as well, okay? Because that means we spent less, we made less money, but that means we also spent less money if we had a, we had a negative variance for our, our budget for our um, labor, okay? So everything is very dependent on the situation. So that's why you as a manager have to take all the pieces of the puzzle and put them together to figure out what the big picture is. And so in math, as much as I love math, there's always an answer, okay? There's always, even if the answer is there is no answer, there's always an answer in math, okay? But when it comes to actually applying it, you have to turn on your critical thinking skills and figure out, does this, is this number a good number or is it a bad number, okay? And so we have to compare that. We have to find that variance. Questions, comments, concerns? Okay. So now we have to address the discrepancies, okay? We have to address the discrepancies. Um, we need to figure out why it is different than it, sh than it should have been, okay? Um, and what are we going to do with that? So if I was supposed to have sold 25 steaks, okay, and then I go back to my kitchen and it looks like 30 steaks walked out the door, what is my difference? Okay, so let's do that real quick. I'm going to do it right here on the screen. What was my actual? 30 steaks walked out the door, right? That's my actual. So let's do 30. What was my expected? 25. And so that means I'm five steaks short, okay? I'm missing five stakes. What am I doing with these five stakes? Where are they going? Okay. And so I need to figure out, oh yeah, Sally misrang two stakes and they had to be remade. Okay. And now I'm short how many stakes? I still got to find three more stakes, right? And you might think, oh, what's the, what's the big deal? It's just three stakes. Three stakes a day times 300, 300 days a year, that's 900 stakes. That's a lot of money that's walking out the door. And if you're not that particular, then your staff is gonna fall into that 80% rule and they're gonna only follow the rules if they know they're gonna be caught. And so if you're, if you're like, oh, it's just three stakes. Well, that person will be like, oh, they were just not worried about three stakes yesterday. So today I'm just gonna give a steak to my friend or today I don't really feel like doing any grocery shopping, so I'm gonna do my grocery shopping at the walk-in <laughs> at the restaurant. And I'm gonna take some steaks and some onions home and I'm gonna have myself a nice steak and mushroom onion, grilled onion, right? So you wanna make sure that people realize that we are watching them. That's your job as a manager. If you just sit in your office, then the, you're not gonna have very much control over the restaurant, okay? Now, does that mean you're gonna be looking over everybody's shoulder every single moment of the time? No. no, that's called micromanaging. Most people don't respond well to micromanaging, okay? You still wanna give them that autonomy and that ability to do their jobs, right? But you wanna make sure they have the tools that are available to them. So if we have Sally Miss Rain two steaks, and Johnny, we're gonna John's in here. No, we don't have any John's. Okay, cool. I just wanna make sure I don't like <laughs> cause any problems for any of you. So Johnny, I'm gonna use Sally and Johnny for the whole semester. Okay. So Johnny missed rang three stakes. So now we've got an issue. Okay. So now we have to do what's what's called coaching. As a manager, you gotta work with Johnny. Hey Johnny, why did you why did you miss ring those three stakes? How many of you have been servers before? Okay. How many of you have forgotten to ask somebody what their meat temperature should be? Right? So if you go to the table, somebody orders a New York strip, and you're like, and you forget, how, what, how would you like that cooked? How would you like that prepared? If you forget that, and you walk over to the, kit, over to the computer, and you're like, um, 
you look like a medium well, and like you put it in there. Or, um, you know what, I'm gonna do medium because that's middle of the road, it's like not too pink, but it's not like super bloody and whatever. I can't just it up if they don't like it. Right? And so, you know, you justify it. But if you forget, then it's like, hey, Johnny, why did you forget? Oh, why did, why did you miss ring this? Oh, I just forget, I forget to ask. Okay, you know what? Here's a little index card. I'm gonna tape it inside your little folder. Don't forget to ask the meat temperature, right? <laughs> Until it gets to be second nature. Um, and so I had that issue, and I say that because I had that issue as a server. I would do that all the time. Because at TGI Fridays, very few people actually ordered steaks. And at Cheesecake Factory, very few people actually ordered steaks. It was, they were ordering other things on the menu. So it's not like I was working at a steakhouse where every single order is a steak, and it can remind me that, oh my gosh, I need to ask for meat temperature. Um, and so I had to remind myself. And so as a manager, if that's a continuous issue, then you need to develop some kind of coaching method to work with that. You can't just say, Johnny, you're fired. You missed rank three steaks tonight. Okay, that's a little dramatic. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are are giving them the best tools that they have. That we, that they have. Now, if we identify the issue is in the kitchen side, let's say we have a brand new grill cook and they don't understand the difference between medium well and medium, okay, or medium rare. And so if that's the case, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I had a scenario like that um, last week. Um, one of my clients asked for a blue steak oh, that's what and, and, um, I was like, sir. What does that mean? They put it like this. That's all they do, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Blue? Yeah. I've never heard that. Okay, I learned something today. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I was like, it's more hey, that's, I wanted to, sir, we'll get it right out for you. So I took it to the back, I ringed it in. They had no clue what blue was. So, yes. Yeah, you had to educate them. In the back, so. Okay. I had no idea. The chef wasn't in at the moment. Yeah. That was a, another, like, side cook. And he didn't know. He had no clue. But. Did he ask before he did it, or he did he try to just no, do he it? he asked. He okay, asked. good. Excellent. Very good. And that's another thing too, like if we can create that culture for people as managers, if we can create a culture where people are not afraid to ask, right? If somebody asks a question, you start yelling at them like, oh my gosh, you should know that you finished training, right? If they ask that question, there's so much to do. So many different intricate parts of service, so many different intricate parts of the kitchen that Yes, you went through a two-week training. That's great. But you're still going to learn every single day. You're still going to experience new things every single day. So if as managers, if we can create that culture where people don't feel afraid or threatened to ask a question, then hopefully that will minimize the number of mistakes that we're going to have. Now, if uh, that being said, if somebody asks the same question 10, 15 times in a row, then we maybe need to focus on a little bit more focused training on that individual, okay? Um, so as a manager, we need to make sure that we are we're identifying those stuff, okay? And staying um, on top of those too, like making sure, like okay, where they send back a steak, we need to make sure they cook it properly. Because I've literally had the same steak for the same table we'll go back two different times because they still cooked it wrong, you know. So it's just making sure you're monitoring, like well, I mean, yeah. How it, or, Monitoring the corrections, you know. Absolutely. Yes, most. I think that goes both ways, though, because a lot of customers sometimes don't even know the difference. They just yeah. assume. So there's a lot of people who, in, uh, per se, think medium rare. They think it goes pink and then slightly red right in the middle, but it's actually where it's hot all the way through. So everybody's perception of what it is is always different. Yeah. So and you should have it sent back three, four times because that's not the way they want it. And but absolutely. They don't know that's what standards are different, too, I believe. Mm -hmm. You can go one place and ask for a medium rare and get it cooked one way and go somewhere else and it's cooked totally different. Absolutely. And so that could also be if you understand like the, the way that a medium rare is prepared for your restaurant. Now, Grant, there is like a, a temperature range really for a medium rare, medium. That's why people ask, what temperature would you like your steak prepared to? Right? Medium rare, medium well, uh, medium. And so um, with that, um, we can have some more coaching. We can also have coaching for our servers. So, you know, when um, I worked at Chester's Hamburgers, at Chester's Hamburgers, we prepared, or they prepared their burgers medium well, which means it has a slight pink center into it. Well, 
slight pink in burgers is different from slight pink in a steak, okay? That ground beef, there's a whole other issue we got going on there, okay? And so um, at Chester's, if we started seeing burgers come back because people are like, oh, there's my burger's still pink, then we just let them know, hey, by the way, next time just make sure you order it well. And so it got to the point where there was a sign right in the front. Our burgers are prepared medium well with a slight pink center. If you just say medium well, what people are focusing on the word well. And so if they want no pink, they have to ask for a well done burger. Okay. What's that? Hot Dotties. Okay. They sell, they, they put, there's almost, uh, there is definitely some heavy pink in the middle. Yeah. So you have to make sure that you ask for it well. But they will ask you, how do you want your burger cooked? Exactly. The burger is cooked to, you know, medium or medium. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let's get to some questions here. Okay, taking corrective action is the first step in the control process. True or false? Thumbs up for true, thumbs down for false. What do we got? It's the correct, corrective, sorry, taking corrective action is the first step in the control process. The answer is false. Corrective action is the last step, right? The first step is to set that standard, to set the standard first, and then you know what you're comparing everything to. The corrective action, making those corrections, is the very last step. So fixed costs remain the same regardless of sales volume. True or false? True. True or false? That is true, okay? That is true. So remember, our, this is our graph, okay? Our sales, I'm going to do green for money for sales. Our sales can go like this, but our fixed costs are going to stay the same. They do not change, although it looks like they change. <laughs> Picture that as a perfectly straight line, okay? Um, they do not change depending on the sales volume. Fixed. Variance is the difference between the actual performance and the projected goals. True or false? True. Good, that is true. A manager's role in cost control is to allow employees to do what they think is best. False. Good, that is false. So, perfect example. I did, when I was at TGI Fridays, I was a student at St. Phillips. I don't know if I told you the story or not. If I did, please stop me. <laughs> And I created desserts by David when I was at TJ on Fridays. Okay. And so my manager, Kristen, I would I was a student and I was learning about plating and you know our recipe was one fudge pouch, one caramel pouch, and some uh, slivered almonds or sliced almonds on the brownie, um, brownie a la mode, right? And so you're supposed to take this, it was basically like a giant pouch, like a ketchup packet of caramel and hot fudge. And you just do like one way with hot fudge, the other way with caramel. And then you put, sprinkle some sliced or slivered almonds on, sliced almonds on there and take it out, right? And so I was a student. And I'm like, no, I want to play with this design because I want to practice these plating techniques that I'm learning all about. And so I took the caramel and I like swizzled it like all around the rim of the plate. And I put the chocolate down before I put the brownie in. Um, and so I did all these kind of fun stuff and I crushed up the almonds and like sprinkled them around the plate and whatever. My manager, Kristen, was like, David, that's not spec. Spec is short for specification. And so at a corporate restaurant like TJ Fridays, you have to follow spec because no matter where they go to a TJ Fridays, anywhere in the world, that brownie is going to have to look the same, that brownie dessert. They have a certain expectation, right? And so Kristen said, that's not spec. You can't do that again. And I was like, okay. So the next came, next brownie came, and I was just like, Okay, what can I do? And so I'm like doing it different, right? And she's like, David, I told you, you cannot do that. Um, she's like, that's not the recipe. And I said, I know, but I'm actually using less than the recipe. Because I poked like this little tiny hole in the hot fudge and squeezed it out so it was all like swiggly and crinkly instead of like this giant nasty glob of hot fudge, right? And I was like, I'm actually using less ingredients on this. And so she was like, okay, you're using less ingredients but it's still not spec. And she said, so if you, if you do that, 
you have to explain to people why it looks that way. So I learned two lessons here. My first lesson was I created desserts by David. <laughs> um, my second lesson was to create something unique about yourself to cause people to come back to sit in your section as a server. So I told people, you have to, this is Desserts by David. I'm a culinary student at St. Phillips. I'm learning about plating designs. Let me know what you guys think about the design. Um, and by the way, you can only get this if you come sit in my section. Because if you come to somebody else, they're going to have to do it the regular way. Right? And so I learned that lesson. Um, again, Kristen could have, uh, okay, so I'm kind of like, I like to break the mold if you haven't noticed. Um, Kristen could have said, no, David, you have to do spec. You have to do it. No if and or buts about it, right? And then I probably would have been like miserable doing my spec and then I really would have had that joy and passion. And so she allowed me to express myself, but still as long, she's like, as long as you're not spending more on ingredients than what it acts, because the way it looks, it lo made it look like I was spending more on ingredients. And so, but at the same time, she was controlling it. You know, she would monitor it and make sure that I was not just doing whatever I wanted. There were certain things where I did have to follow spec, and I did have to follow the certain way of doing that. Variance is always expressed as a dollar amount, true or false? false? Good, that is false. It can be counted, the number of stakes. Um, it can be weighed, okay? So um, we should have sold 200 pounds of potatoes. When I look at my waste sheet, and there's 10 extra pounds that I wasted throughout the day. So I actually used 210 pounds of potatoes. So I wasted 10 pounds of potatoes. So that variance is not just a dollar amount. It can be in a variety of ways. Oh, sorry. Prime cost includes only food and beverage cost. That is false. What does it include? Labor. Labor as well. Cost that change based on the sales, but not in direct proportion. Semi-variable. Good. Semi-variable. Okay. So remember, here we go. So our sales, again, are green. Our semi-variable costs right here, they might go up and go down a little bit and go up and then go up. But they're not in direct proportion. Okay. If I had, let's use blue in this case. My um, variable costs, if they are truly variable, then they will mirror in direct proportion to our sales, okay, in direct proportion. The profit formula is what? Profit formula. Good. Sales minus expenses. That gives us our profit, profit or loss. A standard that refers to the raw product or the production method is what? Quality. Good. Quality standard. Okay. The quality. So is this steak grilled? Is it broiled? Is this fish baked? Is it um, sautéed? Is it what? Fried. Fried. Okay. Good. So that standard that refers to the production method also is a quality standard. Costs that change in direct proportion to sales are variable. good, our variable cost. What's an example of our variable cost? Food cost. Food cost is one. Yeah. Wages. Wages. Okay, so labor as labor as a whole is a semi-variable because it has salary, which is fixed, and wages, which is variable. So wages are the, are the employees that are paid by the hour, okay? Those are Rent and insurance typically are examples of what kind of cost? Good, they are not controlled. We can't control them. Which is the most important cost for a food service manager to control? That is our prime cost, okay? All right, so that is the end of chapter one.